Uh, we will start the uh, opening ceremony and keynote speech soon. The language of opening ceremony will be Korean. Simultaneous interpretation will be supported. So please bring the uh, headset from the back of the classroom and uh, uh, right uh, next to the door. Overseas researchers joining in Zoom, please click the global uh, below the uh, Zoom uh, window and select uh, English. Okay, welcome to Seoul and uh, to uh, Jungang University. I'm Woo Hyung Jeon, working at uh, Jungang University's RCCG Research Center. Uh, okay, Kevishikechosunsonin,中央で、パクサンギュー、チョンジャンにめ、ファニョン、インサイミダ。オネチバンエソテアクチョンジャンヒョビウェ、チャムゾクチュンイシラ、オンラインのインサイマイスメルチョ
통영상에 있는 것입니다. 귀한 시간에 참석해주신 모든 여러분들께 다시 한번 깊은 감사의 말씀을 전하며 오늘 모으신 모든 분들께 항상 행복과 건강이 함께 하시기를 기원합니다. 감사합니다. 소장님 정말 감사합니다. 지금 이 자리에 모이신 국내외 연구자들께서 큰 박수로 예, 총장님의 환영사를 예, 예, 감사히 받았습니다. 어, 바쁘신 중에도 친히 뜻깊은 환영의 말씀을 해주셔서 정말 감사합니다. 중앙대가 전 세계의 중앙이 될수 있도록 우리 연구단도 최선을 다하겠습니다. 감사합니다. 다음은 어, 중앙대 한국외대 인문한국플러스 적경인문학연구단의 단장님이신 손준식 교수님의 개회사가 있겠습니다. 다시 한번 큰 박수로 맞이해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. 네, 안녕하세요. 어, 중앙대 한국외대 인문한국플러스 석경인문학연구단 단장을 맡고 있는 손준식입니다. 뭐 방금 우리 총장님께서도 말씀하셨다시피 그간 닫혀 있던 국경을 넘어 어, 우리 중앙대학에서 국내외 연구자 내빈 여러분을 만나게 되어서 감회가 새롭습니다. 아울러 이 만남이 잠시 멈춘 세계를 다시 시작하게 하길 간절히 기원합니다. 오늘부터 3일간 열리는 ABRN 학술 대회는 음, 국경 지대의 미래 어, 기술 구역 공존이라는 주제로 아시아의 국경 지대를 화해와 공존의 새로운 지평을 모색하고자 합니다. 국경은 우리가 생각하는 것처럼 단선적이거나 영원 불변한 공간이 아닌 것 같습니다. 게다가 꽤 가까이 있기도 합니다. 이제 국경 연구는 국경에 대한 몇몇 오해를 바로잡는 데부터 출발할 필요가 있다고 생각합니다. 역사적으로 국경은 초국경적 협력과 통합의 과정이 진행된 접속지대로서 상호의존과 관용 그리고 새로운 문명의 탄생 등 다양한 삶을 빚어낸 개방적이고 역동적인 장소에 가까웠습니다. 아, 우리는 이 국경을 지정학적 경계선이 아닌 화해와 공존을 위한 공공재로 재인식할 필요가 있습니다. 이번 학술대회가 우리 앞에 놓여있는 그 어떤 경계마저도 거두어내고 화해하고 공존하며 지속가능한 삶을 기획하는 연대의 시작이기를 바랍니다. 제7회 ABRN 국제학술대회에 참가해주신 국내외 연구자 여러분 국경 지대로부터 화해와 공존의 역사와 문화를 발견하고 기록하는 연구를 위해 우리 접경인문학연구단과 더욱 자주 만나면 좋겠습니다. 국경을 넘어 자유롭게 만나 더욱 건강히 연구할 수 있기를 바라는 마음을 담아 일곱 번째 ABRN 국제학술대회의 개회를 선언합니다. 2022년 6월 13일 접경인문학연구단 단장 손준식 어, 지금 내리는 비가 여름에 이 더위를 가시게 해주는 것처럼 이 단장님의 개회사가 국경을 얻는 일이 훨씬 더 자유로워지기를 바라는 소망처럼 들렸습니다. 다시 한번 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 저희가 25일까지 학술대회를 마치고 나서 26일에 저희가 학술답사를 떠나게 됩니다. 그 학술답사 떠나는 것과 관련해서 잠깐 어, 그 에비알렌 어, 컨비너 선생님이 에, 컨비너이신 그, 어, 그 예, 선생님께서 잠깐 소개를 해주시겠습니다. Thank you very much. I would like to join Dr. Park and Professor Song in welcoming you. I, I do so in um, on behalf of the Asian Borderlands Network uh, Research Network ABRN. And we're very happy to be here today. Um, perhaps some of you know about ABRN, others may not. So let me quickly say a few words about this network. Um, it started with a conference in India in 2008. 
when borderland studies in Asia were still quite fragmented and small, but there was amazing enthusiasm for the theme. So we decided to create a network and um, develop uh, uh, a website that you can find. More recently, we've developed a blog to which all of you are invited to contribute. Um, we uh, then decided to have conferences every two years in a different Asian country. And we've been moving from India in 2008 to Thailand, then to Singapore, Hong Kong, Nepal, Kyrgyzstan. And then in 2020, we were very happy that uh, the um, research um, center for reconciliation and um, um, coexistence in, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in uh, uh, contact zones here at the University of Chungang was willing to uh, co-host uh, the conference here. Um, we always uh, co-organize with local res uh, research centers or, or universities. And so we were very happy to uh, be in Korea, especially because in 2020, uh, South Korea was commemorating 70 years since the beginning of uh, uh, the, uh, the Korean War. And of course, if there's one border in Asia that uh, has been studied in great detail, it's that border. But as we know, tiny organisms can play havoc with the best laid human plans. So now we are here two years later. We are very grateful to the university that they, uh, they still wanted to organize the conference. Um, we're sorry that many participants can only be here online, virtually. Uh, and we hope that the next conference will be completely offline. Um, so uh, I hope you will enjoy the conference and have a good time. And please let us know of any um, improvements you would like us to make for future events. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for wonderful greetings. OK, uh, after a while, the keynote speech will begin at uh, 5.45. The language of the keynote, uh, keynote speech is in English. Uh, if you want to listen in Korean, please uh, use a headset. Please <laughs> return the headset uh, you brought earlier in the uh, bag, at the bag, after a while. The theme of keynote speech is whose borders and borders for whom, uh, radically flying, Udere Naise Line and Korean DMG. Professor Yong Gu Cha is a professor of history, department, and global border studies at Chungang University in Seoul, Korea. His main research and uh, teaching interests focus on border history in medieval Europe. He has uh, published, among other papers, discourse on borderland history between German and Polish historians from frontier to uh, contact zones, Eastern border studies in the uh, German historiography of the 20th century. And his most uh, recent uh, book, History of Borders, Adopting the Borderscape as Method. Please welcome with big applause. Thank you for kind inter introduction. Uh, the language 어, 발표를 요청을 해서 영어로 하도록 하겠습니다. 그리고 어, 한국 번역본이 아마 배포되어 있을 겁니다. So, uh, good afternoon or good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, my today's topic is, uh, can you hear me? Okay, with mask, it's okay? Okay, no mask. Are there? 
Okay, thank you. My today's topic is uh, whose borders and borders for whom? Uh, Red Cliff Line, as you know, and Odin Ice Line, and the Korean DMZ. After World War II, the people of India and Korea celebrated their liberation from imperial powers of Great Britain and Japan. Meanwhile, defeated Nazi Germany had been occupied by the victorious allies, United States and Great Britain, France and Soviet Union. Liberation and occupation brought about totally different feelings. Liberated Koreans and Indians rejoiced at their liberation. Meanwhile, defeated Germany worried about their survival. However, the imposition of borders was a common a concern for all three countries. I mean, India, Korea, and Germany. Please look at the uh, slide. Uh, these are three borders uh, about which I will today speak. Uh, from left, all the nice line between Poland. Uh, I think it's a little uh, small, but sorry for that. <laughs> Uh, organized line between Poland and reunified Germany, reunified in 1990. And in the middle, uh, Red Cliff line uh, between India and Pakistan. Actually, today's Bangladesh has been established by, also by this Red Cliff, Red Cliff line. Uh, lastly, the Korean DMZ which was 38th parallel designed after World War II. So these are the big three of, as you know, World War II. From left, Stalin in the middle, Roosevelt and Churchill. In Tehran, 1943, uh, they met in Tehran. And Stalin here, for the first time, suggested organized line as compensation for the territories east of the so-called cousin line, which USSR wanted to gain. Churchill and Roosevelt, I emphasize unwillingly agreed with Stalin's suggestion or propose. However, they need Stalin's military help or support for winning the Second World War. So they unwillingly accede to Stalin's demands. Liberated countries like India and Korea were divided by new borders. I also emphasize new borders the Red Cliff Line and 38th Parallel, respectively. I say new borders because borders had been historically an unfamiliar concept to Korean and Indian citizens. Early occupied Germany also got new border, organized line, which became Polish and German border. All three borders were newly, newly created after World War II and elicited on effective dimensions of traumatic exper experience, hate, and lamentation. Comparative perspective. What these three borders have in common is that they were created not by the countries in which 
the border existed, but by foreign powers, Red Cliff Line between India and Pakistan was, as the name Red Cliff suggests, demarcated in red ink by a British, law, British lawyer, Sir Cyril Redcliffe, who had never been to India before and never returned to India after doing his job to create the border. His job took just only five weeks, only five weeks. On the eve of Great Britain's retreat from India, British imperial power had arbitrarily drawn the border and decided the fate of millions of people. So he is Mulana Achat. Uh, he is the first minister of education in the new Indian government and he is also an eminent Muslim scholar and poet. He said in his biography, I quote, people of India had not accepted partition with free and open minds. Some had accepted it out of sheer anger and resentment, and others out of sense despair. Quote end. From his memories, we can read how partition provoked anger, despair, and indignance, indignation among Indian people. In Germany or in Poland, the organized line has a similar but more dramatic history. Stalin claimed, as, as I said, Poland's eastern borderlands, the Polish provinces east of so-called Cousin Line, as a kind of souvenir of the world, and shifted the border of USSR 250 kilometers to the west. He had reconstituted Poland's border to shoot his knees as compensation for territorial losses, Stalin promised to Poles the conquered German lands, territories, east of the Oder and Nice River, Fitchia, Pomerania, and Silesia, or the Polish corridor of Pomerania and Silesia. This is how the German-Polish border moved west, moved west 200 kilometers, thus moving whole Poland, whole Poland, decisively westward, west Fersheben. This Poland case shows that the delineation of borders can precede the state building process. In Korea, the Korean peninsula was divided divided neither by, by colonial power nor a warring country. As I said, India was divided by colonial power, Great Britain, and uh, Germany was divided by warring, warring country, Soviet Union. But Korea was neither by colonial power nor a warring country. In August, 1945, two allies, the United States and Soviet Union, that had liberated colonial Korea, agreed to share control over, over the peninsula. Korea, which had just celebrated its liberation from decades-long Japanese occupation, was neither a colony of America or Soviet Union, nor an enemy of them. Two occupying powers brought about the division of Korea, a liberated country. I emphasize a liberated Korea divided into two zones. 
this became a terrible burden for future generations like me or like us living on this peninsula. To sum up, the above mentioned borders, did you see, uh, there are many other borders, but uh, these uh, three borders, the above mentioned borders were created by foreign powers. They were drawn up without those powers seeking the consent of the people who lived there for centuries. This unilateral de uh, decision elicit, elicited considerable public resentment in the respective communities. So, post-colonial borders. The 1945 partition of Korean Peninsula alongside 38th parallel and the Korean War, 1950-53, led to displacement and separation of up to 10 million family units. The war killed at least 2.5 million people. As we know, the war began on the 25th June 1950. So we celebrate in two days uh, the 72nd anniversary of the Korean War. The armistice that ended that war left the peninsula divided much as before, with the militarized zone, DMZ, running roughly along the 38th parallel. In India, the 1947 partition of India displaced more than 10 million people along religious lines, triggered, triggering one of the largest population movement in the history. In German or in Poland, four million Germans had been expelled from Poland's regained or recovered territories. Today, I will refrain from speaking about the inhuman or degrading treatment of German, Indian, Pakistani, and Korean refugees. The colonial period came to an end. However, post-colonial -bo post borders caused severe trauma to all involved. As you can see, the traumatic refugees, evacuations. The ramification of their establishment came back again, again, to haunt citizens of the affected countries through conflict, violence, and hostilities. Hostilities. So, as you, uh, I hope you can see the pictures where, but as you see in these pictures, these three countries suffered the same trauma elicited by territorial changes of their countries. This is why it does seem to me, to me that the refugees of these pictures look like similar. They all seem to be hungered, scared, and no hope of having a better future. Millions of people were evacuated, disabled, and raped. So this is a red cliff line and the Korean DMZ from the sky or from, the, from space. This sky view shows how the division is still present until now, and the wounds and pains generated by division are still fresh. However, it has been asserted that the Western powers aim to create a buffer zone between two deadly rivals, they say. 
such as North and South Korea, India and Pakistan, and Germany and Poland. For centuries before 1945 division, however, Korea was a single unified country ruled by Goryeo dynasty, dynasty 918-1392, and Joseon dynasty 1392-1910. Because there was, in fact, no South, there was no South and no Korea, Koreans. Koreans, they did not need a buffer zone. For what? Whose buffer zone is it? On Indian, sub, Indian subcontinent, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs lived separately. But peacefully together for centuries, as we know, until Britain employed divide and conquer or divide and rule strategy. Before Hitler's invasion of Poland in 1939, Germans living in Poland or, and Polish people expressed no antagonistic nationalism toward, toward each other. So, a buffer zone for whom? The ideological, communist, and capitalist, and geopolitical goals of these three great allied powers created the new borders during the turbulent times of after World War II. So, we go back to our question, or my question, my first question. Whose borders? and borders for whom. There was no ethnic religious antagonism, as I said, between neighboring people, South and North Korea, India and Bangladesh, Pakistan, or German or Poland. So why these Western powers establish borders? For what? For whom? To be answered. Center and periphery. However, also the new government who had been established after World War II, such as those South and North Korea, India and Pakistan, and Germany and Poland, they also had their own border policies. They have owned their own border strategies. So border issues became politicized. The authoritarian regimes and political allies of North and South Korea continue to use border issues to enhance their political power, as did nationalist Pakistani and Indians. So central power used their border or their peripheries for their own central political powers. Yeah, uh, this is uh, a scene of uh, one famous Korean film. Uh, it's Gongjak. Many Korean students know Gongjak. And in English, the spy gone knows. A highly interesting film. I can recommend you to watch this film when you have enough time during your stay in Korea, or in Netflix. Netflix, maybe. So, uh, in this film. Agents in this film, in this film, uh, agent of North and South Korea closely, closely cooperated to manipulate the political election of South Korea. However, in the realities, in the realities, there are many cases or there are many times in which two governments, South and North uh, Korean government, they triggered or intensified the tension alongside DMZ for their own political purposes to enhance their internal power and cohesion. We say no swine. 
it's like in the film, no swine, a term. So we are all specialists. So I think many can recognize what does no swine mean, OK? So no swine, a term actually used by media to explain how the North Korean government secretly intervened in the domestic affairs of South Korea. In April 1979, as you can read in this uh, newspaper's article, in April 1999, before, before the uh, presidential election, South Korean agents met uh, their North Korean partners in China. Why? To request military intervention or tension, including army movement in DMZ. So even before war was over, Poland, so, <coughs> yes. So you can see a Polish soldier marking the Polish-German borders on the Oder River in April. In April, the war was not yet over. There were still combat or battles in Berlin. So in April, so before the end of the war, 1945, the Polish soldiers set up uh, Polish boundaries post. So alongside, along the Oder and Nice rivers, then accompanied by clear border closers and relentless communist propaganda against the aggressive, I quote, against the aggressive and expansionist Germany. Not the Polish Communist Party used the borders as means to integrate their society and legitimate the communist new communist rule. They used border for their own purposes. It's the history of borders. In West Germany, experts, so Heimat Piotr Rivene, they gave their votes to the conservative parties in 1950s, 60s, so until 1970s, until Billy Brandt uh, got the power. So they denied new frontiers. They, they denied new frontiers, organized line. They denied and asserting their right to lost territories or asserting their right to Heimat. To borrow Frank Ville's phrasing, Frank Ville, he is our tomorrow's uh, speaker, I, see, I, saw, I think so. So according to him, this could be labeled, I quote, territorial phantom pains, quote end. Border thinking in the post-Cold War era, or I would like to say in the post-Berlin War era. With regard to order nice line, international and domestic factors prevented the borders formulation, a uh, formal uh, recognition, sorry, the borders formal recognition until German reunification on the 3rd October 1990s. That is to say, the official recognition of order nice line as Poland's legitimate and inviolate border did not take place until 45 years after the end of the World War II. So just after 1990s, it, takes, it took reconciliation and coexistence, coexistence regarding border issues, can be said. In Korea, from so you know from the year 2000 on, inter-summit between inter-Korean inter summit between South and North Korea took place five times in 2000, in 2007, and three times, three times between Moon Jae-in and 
uh, North Korea's chairman, Kim Jong-un, in 2018. The symbolic cross-border, the symbolic cross-border cooperation of the mountain Gungang and Gungang tour program and Gaesung industrial zone is born out of the born out of the post-Cold War transformation. These are, uh, these are uh, photos of five times inter-Korea summit. Interestingly, all three South Korean president who met North Korean leaders, they are all from the progressive and left-leaning government. They all from, three, all three are from progressive and left-leaning parties. However, as you know, we have a new president since three months. He is the leader of the conservative and nationalist right-wing parties. That's why many scholars, including me, are afraid of tension alongside the Korean DMZ or diminished cooperation between North and South Korea. According to Samuel Huntington, in his famous book, Clash of Civilization, Ukraine is historically, politically, and culturally, Ukraine, divided into Western and Eastern part. The Western part, as you know, had been occupied and influenced long time by Poland and Austria Habsburg and Roman Catholic. Meanwhile, the eastern part, nowadays Donbass, Donbass influenced by Russia and Greek Orthodox. The tragic process recently happened in Ukraine represent this our lens, our lesson from Ukraine, from tragic process. The leaning to one side strategy in the case of Ukraine, either European Union or Russia could trigger or enhance the risk of provocate, provocate, <coughs> provoking the other side, the other side. So as pivot state, South and North Korea and Ukraine, such pivot state between superpowers, they should do more effort of domestic bilateral, bilateral cooperation than leaning to one side. I think it's our lesson from Ukraine's war. So during the time in which Moon Jae-in and Kim Jong-un, North and South Korea's leaders, met three times, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, he also, as you see, exchanged warm handshake also three times, same time, three times, with Trump in Singapore, in Hanoi, and in Panmunjom. Actually, Trump visited Japan uh, to G20 summit, and he came to Panmunjom to meet Kim Jong Un. As seen above, the history of borders, their emergence, management, and cooperation regarding them has been connected with international relations and made by political discourses institutions, social textbook, and media. Traditional concept of the border define the border as a static, unchanging future. However, as, Vlad as Vladimir Korosov and James Scott argued in their article published in 2013, I quote, Borders are not only semi-permanent institutions, but also non-finalizable processes, quote, end. Additionally, I quote, 
the shifting character of state border themselves, quote, and reflect non-finalizable makings and remakings of political boundaries. Therefore, I suggest, this is my suggestion, or my hope, we should not give up on the possibility of transforming the Korean demilitarized zone, Korean demilitarized zone, DMZ, into, into peace and life zone. Because, as I said, because borders are constantly being created, confirmed, and challenged. So, my last sentence, Pandora's box. Today, I would not dare to make a moral judgment here on the borders that Western powers drew on the world political map. Germans, Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladesh, and South North Koreans, on whom I today focused, are still facing a double burden, a double burden, when it comes to borders. Namely, first, they never consented, they never consented to the drawing of these borders. Secondly, the lives and future of people living on these borders are defined or will be defined by these borders. Therefore, I suggest border studies should take the phenomenon of double burden of borders into consideration in the future. Thank you for your attention. It was an interesting keynote speech and uh, lecture uh, about the uh, origins and metamorphosis uh, uh, of borders and uh, the possibility of borders that connect and solidify us, not borders that uh, divide and uh, separate us. Uh, I really learned a lot. Thank you again. Uh, Okay, now we have a last and very important session, a uh, 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 welcome reception. Uh, welcome reception will begin now. Uh, it is raining outside, but uh, I think it would be better to walk a, a, a little together. Uh, on your map, uh, on your campus map, uh, we put it in your tote bag. Uh, you can find the university club on the 11th floor of building 102. Uh, so uh, meet there. Thank you.